the oasis of growth in a growth stout world seems to be having some issues and some potential headwinds at a point of time when the news flow and the chatter around growth or the lack of it has reached well maybe not cacophony but a fairly large shrill i thought it's best to get somebody who i've known to call a spade a spade sonal verma of nomura to just try and assess how does she think about the growth aspects currently sonal good having you thanks for joining me thank you um what is your thought around the recent prints and the underlying factors behind uh, the growth numbers it's a mixed bag uh, so i think uh, it's become difficult to interpret because uh, you have had uh, upward revisions to the past data which is uh, uh, skewing the year over year numbers uh, and there are also base effects at play so uh, i mean our own uh, assessment is uh that the momentum in the economy is slowing and you know that assessment we reach not on the basis of the yoi growth rate of 4.4 uh but really the seasonally adjusted quarter on quarter momentum on gdp uh which was around 1% so analyzing uh, just a shade above 4% even on a quarter on quarter analyzed basis so uh i think the one interpretation therefore is that the economy was growing faster than expected uh, post pandemic uh, but as far as the more recent momentum is concerned that does seem to be slowing down uh, and then when you look at the components uh, of uh, growth and their you know similar momentum uh, this drop in momentum is primarily i would say driven by the slowdown in uh, exports and global demand which is also filtering into the manufacturing sector uh, also partly because of uh, the higher commodity prices Uh, and the lagged impact of that on uh, profit margins uh, and to increase at least in the third quarter numbers uh, we did see uh, private consumption momentum also slow down uh, so uh, it does look like uh, the impact of higher inflation uh, on consumption demand uh, has also played out so uh, there is evidence of a uh, non you know the global demand slowing but i would say this time around also signs of domestic demand uh, moderation uh, because of uh, higher inflation uh, and margin pressures before i come to the elephant in the room with regards to demand there was a thought expressed that when it comes to urban discretionary uh, that if 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 there was a mean that you could have drawn then because of a post covid effect and a post lockdown opening up effect the urban demand overshot what was the normal curve and now is not is just retreating to mean and has not dipped below mean and one should take heart from that would you believe that to be the case or is your view different i i think that's a fair assessment uh, in fact uh, you know uh, this is true in india on urban discretionary demand uh, this is in fact uh, true in even on corporate profits if you draw a similar mean line uh, corporate profits have moved uh, above their pre pandemic uh, trend uh in fact uh, neil this is also true in a lot of global indicators uh, so for instance us retail sales uh, there has been an upward shift in uh, you know mean as well so it is true uh, you know compared to the pre pandemic trend uh, we are still higher uh, but essentially from a momentum perspective it does look like uh, it was not a permanent shift in trend uh, it was supported by certain factors uh, you know could be accommodative policies could be you know fiscal transfers in the case of uh, us uh, and we are now normalizing back to trend uh, but as far as incremental demand is concerned it is going to be slower hmm. is so so now based on your assessment of past cycles and maybe this is a very different cycle from what the past cycles would have been or would you believe that there will be an accentuated case of further lower prints as far as urban discretionary or urban demand goes in india yes that is our view i i think uh, the uh, there are uh, two three factors uh, at uh, play uh, one is i think the impact so urban demand actually held up uh, reasonable has done exceptionally well uh, partly because urban consumers did have the excess uh, savings buffer which was not there for uh, rural consumers so when high inflation hits you uh, if you have the savings buffer you can still draw down on your savings and spend uh, so you did see a bigger impact on rural demand compared to uh, urban uh, demand uh, but i do think a lot of that excess uh, saving uh, 
has uh, been used up uh, in urban India, the impact of the uh, monetary policy tightening uh, in terms of you know the increase in lending rates, whether it's on homes or cars or whatever, uh, the full impact of that is actually going to uh, impact uh, the discretionary side of demand uh, only going forward. Because you know when you start increasing interest rates, the first 50, 100 basis point don't really hit you much because you're normalizing from very, very accommodative levels. So it's really the last, you know, I would say three to six months of tightening uh, and its impact on uh, borrowing costs, which will incrementally now start to show up in incremental credit growth uh, and incremental discretionary uh, demand. Uh, the second aspect is um, the job market. So, mo I mean, I think in general, things are, you know, good and improving in India, but where you're seeing a bit of a shakeout is uh, on the tech sector, startup, gig economy kind of uh, jobs uh, incrementally. So you will see some impact from the younger consumers uh, who work in these uh, sectors also potentially uh, going uh, forward. So, I mean, all, all, all these considerations, uh, we do think that uh, therefore, we saw an outperformance of urban discretionary demand post pandemic. Uh, the period of that outperformance is basically uh, behind us for now. Oops, and and and, and rural is hurting. And if indeed uh, we have an El Nino and thereby led by following that, if at all a drought year, then could rural, which is already hurting, continue to hurt further? Sonal, and how bad could that be? We are less concerned on rural demand, I would say, at the margin. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, and this is, uh, I would say, both a relative as an as well as an absolute uh, view, um, because you know the biggest drag for rural India was this uh, inflation actually as a threat to uh, rural demand, uh, and. Now, actually, coming to your El Nino question, I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now on how this plays out. Uh, so this is a risk we need to monitor. Uh, but you know, how severe an El Nino it's going to be? What is its impact? You know, which month it's going to hit? Uh, what is its impact on food production? If production gets hit, then will we actually see an impact on prices? Because you've had periods in the past of you know, El Nino, not so bad rains or, you know, bad rains, less impact on production or production hit, but price impact is not there. So I think we're crossing, like hopping over so many bridges to come to the view that El Nino is equal to, you know, high inflation and uh, bad production and therefore bad for rural demand. I think uh, we need to basically think once, take one step at a time. Right now, to my mind, it's a risk. Uh, it is not a clear cut negative. Uh, Given the uh, moderation in inflation from a real income perspective, uh, that actually at the margin is becoming a positive for uh, rural. And if you look at where, like amongst the growth drivers in India, the one segment that is still doing very well is this infrastructure and investment side. Uh, and to that extent, you know, construction activity does tend to be better for uh, rural uh, income. So I would say. Uh, glass is more half full actually uh, at this stage, and and the budget kind of also helped in in that because it seemed that uh, it, while it was a pre-election uh, budget, uh, the there was no freebies per se. The polity uh, moved towards providing jobs and employment and income through spend on infra, so to say. If you would reckon that would hold true for two thousand twenty-three as a year. The strategy is basically not a short term, uh, you know, approach to boosting rural income, uh, but more of a medium term approach, either through mechanisms that improve uh, productivity in agriculture, you know, creating new markets for them or this infrastructure construction and that leading to more jobs and therefore job driven uh, demand rather than, you know, just a one time cash transfer uh, kind. So. This is a more sustainable strategy to get uh, higher rural demand. Uh, and it's also a non-inflationary way to get uh, higher rural demand because you don't want uh, to you know, announce a policy that helps uh, demand in one sector 
uh, but then leads to broader macro uh, issues on inflation and current accounts. So I think this is the right uh, strategy. Okay. Now, Sonal, I'm just trying to mix uh, the globe and in India within that. Uh, if indeed, I mean, one, I, I'm, what would the house you and your own view around what's happening in the US? Because uh, the, there is, I mean, the wage growth data, while strong until recently, um, is it showing some signs of a cool off, if at all? And could that have an impact on what uh, the central bank does? Though I thought, the, I thought the statements in the last 24 hours make it clear that there are no rate cuts for 2023, at least maybe only 2024. And how does that force the hand of an EM central bank like India at a point of time when growth may not necessarily be strong? Will they have the ability to go out and help via some tinkering with interest rates? Sure. Uh, so on uh, the US side, I think first uh, the outlook has become a lot more uncertain. Uh, and, you know, the scenarios from here, I think we need to be open to all kinds of scenarios possible. Now, as a house, our view is the more recent data around jobs, uh, retail sales, uh, etc. do suggest that the economy had more momentum uh, than we had anticipated. Uh, and, uh, you know, we did think that the recession would start uh, Q1 of this year. Uh, but so far, uh, the Q1 growth numbers are also tracking positive. You know, job growth is still positive. Uh, so the economy has more momentum. And that does suggest that there's a risk of a delayed uh, slowdown in the economy. Uh, and the momentum in inflation, we did see, uh, you know, this inflation. Uh, but uh, mainly driven by the goods sector. Uh, and in the last uh, couple of months, that pace of goods disinflation is essentially bottoming out. In fact, we've seen some pickup uh, in goods uh, inflation, which has lifted our uh, inflation trajectory for the US for the first uh, four or five uh, months. So in the backdrop of at least for now, a more resilient uh, economy and higher or slower pace of disinflation uh, the clear takeaway and you know markets have rightfully taken that takeaway is that the job is not done. Uh, what does it mean uh, for the Fed is uh, the uh, you know more tightening essentially uh, is to come. Uh, our uh, US team uh, has uh, raised their uh, terminal Fed funds rate. Uh, we were earlier looking at a five percent uh, terminal rate. Uh, we're now expecting. Uh, 5.5 to 5.75% uh, terminal rate. Uh, and they now uh, also see a uh, 50 basis point hike uh, at the March uh, meeting. So a more aggressive Fed on the back of this uh, data. Uh, now, obviously, you know, the more rate sensitive sectors of the economy, notwithstanding recent volatility, uh, those segments are still slowing. And we do expect the Fed to stay at that elevated level through throughout 2023 uh, until March of 2024, which is when we expect the uh, first cut. So um, the uh, growth slowdown in US uh, and the recession in US is still uh, you know, our baseline, even though the risk right now look like it is uh, delayed. Now, what does it mean for uh, an EM central bank? I think, uh, I mean, clearly it makes the job a lot more challenging when you have an inflation problem. Uh, I, we do think that uh, increasingly uh, central banks, particularly in Asia, will focus more on local factors than just global factors. Of course, you know what the Fed does, its impact on FX uh, has to be monitored. But if you have domestic growth issues or if domestic inflation is not you know, as big a problem as it is in the U.S., you cannot just be importing U.S. monetary policy. If we face FX issues, we have the FX reserves to basically defend the currency. Uh, but, you know, it, therefore, we do think uh, it restricts an EM central bank's hand in terms of doing anything at all uh, to support growth uh, for now. Uh, but there will be a policy divergence, uh, you know, between... Uh, EM central banks, uh, and I would say particularly Asia uh, versus what the US does uh, going forward. Okay, so, so, so you do reckon that there is a possibility that at some point of time, 
the RBI may be able to step in if it deems fit uh, to support growth and not be as hawkish as uh, maybe it normally would be in a scenario like what we may have at hand for the better part of 2023. So I think, uh, right, no, so the next, uh, you know, two, three months, which is when, you know, this final leg of Fed tightening uh, is ongoing, clearly central banks uh, in EM Asia uh, are going to be more hawkish. Uh, some will walk the talk, some will not, but you know, mm -hmm. most will be on the hawkish side. Um, but as we look into the second half of uh, 2023, uh, the Fed uh, is going to be on hold at a higher level, but on hold. Uh, and the forward-looking indicators uh, on inflation do suggest, at least for Asia, where inflation has been more supply side than demand side uh, in the US, like most Asian countries do not face a wage price spiral risk, uh, which is, uh, you know, a worry that the US uh, has. Uh, so given the drop in commodity prices uh, since middle of last year, we are seeing pipeline price pressures actually ease here, which will show up in inflation, both headline and core over a period of, uh, I would say, the next uh, three, four months. And uh, the nature of recovery in U.S. is also not helping the Asia because Asia is a goods manufacturing hub. A services-led recovery doesn't help. But if the Fed is hawkish and you have tight financial conditions, you know, companies are not going to invest uh, when cost of capital is high and demand is so uncertain. So forward-looking uh, growth indicators on final demand, particularly on CAPEX, uh, are looking a lot softer. So yes, uh, you know, beyond, uh, you know, mid-2023, as we look into the back half of 2023, uh, even as the Fed is on hold, local factors, which is lower inflation and weaker growth, we do think will mean that central banks will focus more on domestic factors. Uh, and some Asian central banks, we believe, will embark on a rate cutting cycle, even if the Fed is on hold. So we have uh, Bank of Korea cutting this year. We also have uh, RBI uh, rate cuts uh, later this year, even though we are still talking about, you know, the probability of an April hike right now. Got it. So my final question, and I'm bringing the focus back on India and growth per se. Um, manufacturing for manufacturing to do really well we need west to do well that's a bit uncertain right now i presume and please correct me if i'm wrong um uh services growth might be an outlier you never know uh, i mean the recent calls from a, a cisco or core side research suggest that maybe the tech spends continue so that might be a saving grace but manufacturing an issue um uh, rural growth may be okay but urban growth or urban consumption is certainly looking like an issue as well um are we looking um at a trending lower growth number or are there factors which could support it, uh, let's say two, three, four months out? I mean, our view is the growth cycle has uh, peaked. So we are looking at the uh, growth uh, rates trending uh, lower on a durable basis over the next uh, 12 months. I think India should stand out as a relative uh, outperformer. Uh, you know, compared to other peers. Uh, but in a global slowdown, uh, India will not be unaffected. So it's a trending, uh, you know, story. It's not a three-month story in our view. Um, you talked about specific segments. Let me actually break it up from the demand side of the economy. So consumption, investment, uh, export, import uh, perspective. Um, our view on, uh, you know, exports clearly the biggest uh, negative uh, going forward to the extent that commodity prices come down and you know imports will also come down as domestic demand slows the net contribution uh, to growth from net exports might be less negative uh, but uh, you know exports will clearly uh, slow down uh, on the consumption side uh, i would say um, the outlook for the next 12 months on aggregate is a moderation compared to fi23 uh, but even there, as we were discussing earlier, it's more the urban discretionary consumption that we'll see a bigger slowdown uh, compared to rural uh, side of uh, demand, which should actually hold up. It's less volatile uh, compared to the um, you know, urban side of uh, consumption. Uh, and on investment, I think that is where uh, we have 
the biggest concern because if you split investment into public versus uh, private, the private investment cycle in the macro environment we are discussing right now uh, does not look conducive uh, for private capex to pick up, uh, whether it's you know the future demand outlook, cost of capital, you know, just broader uncertainty. Uh, so we do think that the private capex is going to be a lot more subdued, which basically means that uh, public capex will have to do the heavy lifting. Now, the budget has clearly shown an intent to do just that. Uh, the main challenge we see there is the revenue support because nominal GDP growth in FI 20 uh, four uh, should be closer to eight to nine percent. So the nominal tax revenue growth assumptions uh, will be more challenging uh, compared to the conservative estimates that the budget has made. So uh, we do think at the end of the day, the government will try to strike a balance in terms of growth support through CAPEX, uh, but probably less than uh, what they have uh, budgeted. So when we put all of these you know, pieces together, uh, our own uh, expectation is FI23 GDP will end up being closer to 6.7, 6.8% uh, versus the 7% estimate because the final quarter is tracking around 4%. Uh, uh -huh. And for FI24, uh, we're looking at a sub below consensus growth of about 5.3%. Uh, Oops. Okay. Uh, Sonal, really it's a appreciate It's relative outperformance uh, story. It, it, you know, it's all relative. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, understandably in such a slowing world, difficult to come out otherwise, but great. Sonal, thanks so much. Thank you for taking the time out and giving us um, all of those insights. Really appreciate you taking the time out. Thank you very much. And viewers, thanks for tuning in.